This is The Steel Report. This week on The Steel Report, a special anniversary for the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra, and our program begins right now. Now from KWWL, this is The Steel Report. We have a real treat for you right now during this segment is we're going to celebrate the 90th anniversary of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra. So obviously, I have brought a two special guests in for this particular program today. Let me introduce them to you right now. Maestro extraordinaire, Jason <laughs> Weinberger. Welcome back to the show. I've had Jason on before and, you know, he's so talented and we don't even have time to talk about all the things that he's accomplished. But he's been the conductor and artistic director for the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra. He holds that Pauline Barrett position right now. That's a, that's a great gift from, from the Barrett family, of course. 17 years now already with the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra. So. Maestro, great to have you back again, Jason. It's a fantastic. And also, I want to welcome to the program, actually for the first time, and this is uh, Rich Freeberg. Rich is now kind of the new executive director of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra, having been in that position just a little more than a year. I think you came in September of last year, if That's I remember correct. correctly. That's correct. So, yeah. And having spent, what, about 20 years up in Minnesota? 22 years in Tw Twin Cities. So welcome and, uh, to this area. Welcome back, actually back, because I know yes. that you were actually on the staff of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra way long time ago. I remember yes, that, yeah, yes, so. in the early 1980s. Um, and um, I was actually the first, at the time it was called Coordinator of Operations. <laughs> coordinator um, of Operations. And, um, <laughs> but I'm basically doing the same thing now, which is all the administrative side of the orchestra. Okay, what we're going to talk about today is a, a wonderful concert coming up here, kind of your birthday concert, I guess. Uh, coming up on New Year's Eve, and this will be a really special program. Rich, why don't you ta start and tell us exactly what's going to happen and how people can take part in not only the concert, but also a party that's going on that yeah, night, too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah we're um, actually just going to have a really fun celebration on, on New Year's Eve. Um, uh, we're going to be at Gallagher Blue Dorn, which is where we have most of our, mm -hmm. most of our concerts. And um, uh, the evening will open um, with a concert in the Great Hall at Gallagher. Um, and it's going to be a night in old Vienna um, yeah. and lots of waltzes and um, a dance floor inside of the, the uh, concert hall. And then, uh, as you mentioned, after the, after the concert, we're going to throw the doors open to the lobby and have a, a mini Times Square set up in the, in the <laughs> lobby and um, have uh, the band Hands of Time is going to be playing light jazz, pops, dancing, food. Um, party favors, uh, countdown to midnight, all of the all the things you expect on New Year's Eve. Vienna at a time of square, that, that's quite a change though. That's a drastic change. <laughs> yeah, right, sure. right, right. Well, let's talk real quickly about how people get tickets. We'll do this several times during the segment here, but best way to get tickets for this concert? Yeah, you can uh, go to our website, which is wcfsymphony.org, um, or you can uh, contact Unitix. We sell our tickets through Unitix, um, and I don't know if this is the time to do a phone number or yeah, we can go ahead yeah, right now yeah okay. we'll put these things up on the screen obviously right now so yeah just give us the phone number right yeah now. okay um, so that phone number is 319-273-4849 uh, to get tickets and we uh, are selling tickets both to the concert and to the after party Jason I want to ask you I mean 90 years for a Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra to me, that sends an incredible statement, and you've been part of it now for 17 years, so what does it mean to you? What, what, what is the role of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra, and what does it mean to have been a part of something that's been around for 90 years? It's really hard to believe, actually, when I, when I think about that myself. And I was here when we celebrated our 75th anniversary. Yeah, okay. I thought, okay, this is like as big as it's gonna get. You know, I'm never gonna <laughs> see another major milestone here. Um, and, and now here we're at the 90th, even starting to think about you know, where we are in 10 years. From now, and I, I think you're right that the the longevity of the organization. I mean, think about the number of concerts, the number of people who have experienced mm -hmm. symphonic music, you know, again and again, or for the very first time, performed by this orchestra. That experience is is really unique. It's a very special thing to have in your community. Not all communities have an orchestra. Right. Most have not had an orchestra for 90 years performing continuously. So this is a really special thing here in our community. It's why we wanted to take this year and turn it into this big celebration. We really wanted to raise awareness about the fact that the symphony's been around so long, and, and, and um, at the same time, we're kind of constantly in this orientation of honoring our history and then looking forward. And I think this event does that well as, as well as our whole season. Well, you know, you've had some concerts already, and one of them actually featured 
a University of Iowa graduate from 1971, James Romig, who uh, his, uh, his uh, piano solo still was nominated, I believe, for a, a Pulitzer Prize this mm -hmm. year. I didn't, right. didn't win, but I mean, just the nomination itself. Some of his music was featured in one of your earlier concerts. By the way, we were on campus at the same time, but I don't think our paths crossed at Iowa unless he frequented the airliner a lot. So, <laughs> so, so I, I doubt that, that he did, but what a talent there. And then for you to feature some of his music and, and some of your other concerts this year already, what, what would you describe as the general theme? Because you have a production mm -hmm. committee that kind of helps you to choose what and selects what uh, you're going to feature, right? Yeah, right. yeah absolutely. Right. We're celebrating our 90th, and, and Rich, at, at some point during the segment, may want to talk a little bit about how that plays out during the season. Certainly, our New Year's event is the big feature of that 90th anniversary celebration. But we had a couple other themes that started to emerge this fall in our concerts. And um, one of the really special things we're doing this year is performing a piece of music on each concert that highlights the work of an outstanding woman, uh, yeah. mostly composers but also performers, as well as at the end of the year, we're going to do a concert highlighting Jane Goodall's work. Right, She's a yes. scientist. Right, exactly. with uh, the chimpanzees. The yeah, exactly. Yeah, and so, right so, so really um, embracing that theme has brought us um, a whole bunch of interesting music and themes to look at during the year. Um, sad to say that these are, these are pieces that aren't heard very often played by orchestras. Right, so. Mm -hmm. so we're really excited about that. And um, the other thing I'd say about these concerts, and I, I, Rich may also want to comment on this, is just this experience of hearing spectacular orchestral music. You know, we mm -hmm. did this piece called Scheherazade at the beginning of the year, one of the most colorful, interesting, truly spectacular pieces mm -hmm. of orchestral music. We just did the Grand Canyon Suite yes. back mm -hmm. in here, here in November, and it um, that is was the American grandeur, just right? Just right. so wow. inspiring. Right. Yeah, and, and that experience is kind of unique to listening to big orchestral works. So we've got those placed throughout our season, combining with some of these other things we're doing. Uh, I think it helps ground people in what orchestras do and what makes them so special. You know, that sound of Scheherazade is, is literally something that no other performing ensemble could make except for an orchestra. So we've really tried to focus on that, finding works that reflect that, and then, of course, branching out into some of these other themes. Just to hear you talk about these works, the passion that you have, it's exciting. <laughs> it really is. And the concert coming up on February 15th, that'll be at the Brown Derby, mm -hmm. which is a very unique venue. Everybody has heard of Mendelssohn, but maybe not the sister, right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. All right. Excited to perform music by Fanny Hensel Mendelssohn, yes. who was Felix Mendelssohn's as you mentioned, less famous sister. And it puts a spotlight on the fact that historically, uh, men had a real advantage in classical mm -hmm. music, particularly in the 18th and 19th centuries. You know, women were sort of moved into those domestic roles. And that pretty much happened with Fanny Mendelssohn. So to perform her music, especially in this intimate mm -hmm. setting at the Brown Derby, it, it's going to bring the audience right up close with an artist that they may never have heard of before, mm -hmm. who's, you know, she was right there as music history was unfolding. So I think it's going to be fabulous to experience her music in that setting, combined with her brother's really interesting sibling. We so call it sibling revelry. 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 <laughs> revelry. And I don't think they had a big rivalry. I think they got along great. Uh, and so they certainly did have these uh, uh, events all the time they went to, these private events, and they would perform their music there. And, and that's the feeling we want to recreate. So again, I think that taps into the history of what mm -hmm. we do, uh, but also trying to present it in a way that brings the music to life for audiences and really gives them an immediate experience of what it's all about. I was thinking, you know, I wonder how many times really in life Mendelssohn went to his sister and said, what, what do you think about this? I oh, mean, sure. the, the mm -hmm. dynamics between the two of them to have these extraordinary talents in the same mm -hmm. household, to me, is just amazing. Yeah, it's it's had to have been going both ways as well. Absolutely, not just, yes. Yeah. 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 Okay, so next then after that, on February 15th, that's a Brown Derby one. Then on uh, March 7th, a unique concert called Honoring our own. So Rich, what's that all about? That's about um, honoring the players in the orchestra to really put the, show, uh, the spotlight on them. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we have uh, Kayla Bellamy, who's our uh, yes. one, bassoonist in our orchestra. Uh, and again, tying into the theme of the female composers, um, Joan Tower, who is a, a, just a, an icon in, uh, in music. In classical music, uh, she's uh, composed a piece called the Red Maple, and it's for bassoon and orchestra. And Fantastic. so that'll be um, that'll be part of that evening. And then um, Brahms Fourth Symphony. Uh, again, Jason was talking about um, the w unique way that we can provide uh, large ensemble, you know, very stirring, mm -hmm. inspirational music. And Brahms Fourth Symphony fits right into that 
right into that. And I know, Jason, you are big on multimedia presentations. In fact, just before we started taping this, they were talking, I think just before we got in the elevator, come up here to the second floor at KWWL, about some multimedia presentation. You really love that a lot. And then the, the one on April 18th, that's going to feature some music from Philip Glass, and that's the one with Jane Goodall you mentioned. So. Is there going to be a multimedia presentation at that one or any of the others? Or? Indeed, at that concert in April, yeah. we're going to be performing the score by Philip Glass okay. um, live with the film called okay. Jane. It's a documentary about right, exactly. Jane Goodall. And this is something special <laughs> orchestras have begun to do the last number of years, is performing these scores to films, different kinds of films, live. So there's a unique challenge there because there's no leeway. We've got to make mm -hmm. sure everything is timed correctly to the film. But this one's unique in that it's not a feature film. Instead, it's a documentary, which I, I got to tell everybody out there, if, if you go see just a preview for this mm -hmm. on YouTube, mm -hmm. you'll be in tears by the time it's over. It's, it's, it's yeah. so moving. And the music is just absolutely wonderful. So the experience of hearing the live music paired with these stirring images, I mean, it's just beautiful, compelling imagery. Together, the impact is like not double what it would be if you separated the two, but like quadruple. You know, mm -hmm. you sort of get a squared effect when you experience these things together live. So this year, we looked at a lot of different multimedia things. We felt that that one, with, um, with the way that it highlights this remarkable woman and, and, this, and her really deep engagement in, in the natural world, mm -hmm. um, those are themes that we were really interested in. And so that film just stood out right away, as opposed mm -hmm. to you know a Hollywood hit. We think right. this one is really going to be very meaningful for the audience. Yeah, I mean, Jane Goodall's research I mean, is some of the most important ever conducted right. in the history of the world. That, that's, there's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. We're going to take a real quick break here. We have to do this occasionally. A reminder <laughs> that we're always online on kwwl.com. We're going to come back and talk about more about the 90th anniversary, the 90th year of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra in just a moment. And welcome back to this week's edition of the Steel Report as we're talking about the 90th anniversary of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra with maestro Jason Weinberger on the end there and the executive director of the symphony, Rich Freebert. So we want to appreciate, I want to say how much we appreciate you taking the time to come in because you guys Absolutely. have a very busy schedule. You've got a lot of concerts coming up. You've got a huge concert that we talked about in the first segment coming up on New Year's Eve. Mm -hmm. We'll bring that up again a little bit later, but uh, Jason, we've talked on the show previously about your background. Uh, you grew up in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. You're a graduate of Yale, mm -hmm. uh, Peabody Conservatory, right? And you, you have such an extraordinary background. When you had the opportunity to come to Waterloo, what attracted you to this small Midwestern area? Oh, you know, that's such a good question. And first of all, I'll just start by saying, you know, so in our 17 years here, Waterloo Cedar Falls has you know, become our home. We were welcomed with open arms when we came. Our, our kids are born here, they're natives, yeah. you know, and yeah. we just love it. So, so we've been very fortunate that uh, my work and Jeanette's opportunities have mm -hmm. brought us here. Um, the one thing I'll highlight is the very first time I got on stage with this orchestra. Uh, it was actually 18 years ago because I auditioned for the orchestra the year before wow, I, okay. I came to the area. Okay. And it was in November of 2001. And I just had this feeling of being on stage with these musicians, like these are the people I was meant to make music with. You wow. know? And you don't experience that very often as a conductor. Often we feel kind of separated from the musicians. They just bring us in, like we were talking about before the show, put us on, the, up. <laughs> put us on the box in the front you know, and, and tell everybody what to do. And, uh, but it, this is completely different. There's such a collaborative mm -hmm. spirit. And um, what's really remarkable is that that feeling for us to get on stage together and feel that sense of trust and that sense of excitement to play together, uh, that's still there. After, after all these years. So I just consider myself very lucky from a work perspective. Um, you know, the other, the other exciting thing is to work alongside people like Rich and really work hard to extend the orchestra's work into the community. And I think that's something the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony has done exceptionally well over the years uh, through our education programs and, and some of the other things we've done. So for me, you look at it, any, any angle you take on this experience of working with this orchestra has been so positive for me. And the fact that you know, my wife and I have, have found this wonderful home here over these years yes. has just been, uh, well, I'll just say this, it doesn't happen to everybody in my line of work. So we think we're very lucky. That's exactly right. Yeah, you and your wife have three small boys, right? What, what, yeah, what two of them aren't so small anymore now. They're, they're almost as tall as me. I, I've got a, a nine and a seven year old, nine and seven, well yeah. off into school and, and doing their thing. And we have, uh, we have a young one who's about to turn two. Fantastic. Well, that, that's amazing. So I want to ask you a little bit, guys, about the, how do you get your talented musicians? And how long do they stay? And how, what's the selection process? Let's say I would like to audition for the Waterloo Cedar Falls 
symphony, but there is not a chair available. So how, 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 how many are there? How do you get them? How long do they stay? You know? Well, the orchestra is comprised of, depending on the instrumentation mm -hmm. for a particular piece, um, from anywhere from 50 to 55 to 65 mm -hmm. players. Um, and um, uh, the players go through an audition process mm -hmm. um, that um, is fairly well prescribed. Uh, it's, uh, a lot of orchestras around the country are in uh, union situations, and so every step of the way has been you know, laid out. Um, but we do uh, go through the, the audition process uh, behind a screen, um, and uh, Jason hears the auditions, players from the orchestra hear the audition, and, um, and we do that. Uh, we've been doing it once a year. We're thinking about maybe doing it um, again um, in the spring here. So if there are folks out there that um, have a significant musical background um, and would like to audition, um, we would welcome them to come in. And Jason, uh, how, how many times do you have to say to someone, can we, can we keep you longer? Or do they, <laughs> do they want to stay? How, how does that work? It's a very good question. You know, in fact, um, we, we have a lot of players who have played in the orchestra for a long time. I mean, we've got members of the yeah. orchestra who are approaching five decades. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And you know, yeah. then we have some college and grad students who mm -hmm. might be in and out in a year or two um, based on their plans. So th there's a spectrum there. But we've worked really hard to establish um, you know, more of that permanent membership. And I think that's the direction the orchestra has gone over the mm -hmm. last, let's say, quarter of yeah. a century, mm -hmm. has really helped improve the quality of the ensemble to have that consistency. And, um, you know, I think we benefit from having a wonderful venue at Gallagher. Mm -hmm. A lot of musicians are interested in playing there. And we try to make the symphony a very welcoming place for players because we want them to enjoy playing with us and, and to right. stay as part of our musical community as long as we can, even though they might have to drive from Iowa City every week or yeah. something uh -huh. like that. Um, and so usually the challenge is with those schedules, the driving, you know, figuring out how do I teach here and play there. But I think the, the symphony here has really done well with, um, with the kind of music we play, the venue we play in, uh, to attract musicians. And uh, we have some absolutely mm -hmm. fantastic Incredible, musicians. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. anybody who comes to a concert is just going to have their jaw drop when they hear some of these players play. And of course, you know, we even feature one of them this year in a, mm -hmm. in a concerto, a solo role. But w when they're in the orchestra playing, you know, just the orchestra stuff, you're, you're floored. Um, so I, I think I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky as a conductor, but the orchestra here has um, has really done a good job, I mean, as an organization, mm -hmm. to attract musicians to play with us. Yeah, sports metaphor, I mean, the orchestra is the ultimate team sport. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. Just, just incredible. And to, to watch the symphony grow over the years, you do have a lot of great community support because without that, you'd, it's hard to go on, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It is. And it's been fascinating to me coming back after being gone for 30 years, uh, the, the change in the composition of the orchestra. Mm -hmm. uh, when I was here in the 1980s, a lot of local players, mostly you know, right here in the right here in the community. Uh, over the years, and like a lot of orchestras, there are more and more musicians who are, as Jason was saying, kind of cobbled together their their living. So they might be in three different orchestras and oh, okay. and teach a studio of students and maybe do some writing and some arranging. So it's it, there's a lot of different ways um, and a lot of just really human and really interesting, passionate stories um, because these people are so dedicated to music. Um, that they're willing to travel, be on icy roads, uh, practice, um, and, and uh, play in all these different venues. And so it's, it's really inspiring to work with those kind of people. Well, that's incredible. We are so fortunate. Jason is, is very humble. Um, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, but we are so fortunate to have mm -hmm. him here, not only for the longevity, which, you know, mm -hmm. the players want to come back and work with him, and, and it's a comfortable situation, but just to have him here in the community. Right. Um, the connection with the community is so important um, for us to continue. Um, we really serve at the, at the behest of the community. Exactly. And to have him here and be a part of the community is so important to us, and we're so fortunate. That doesn't happen a lot over right. all, across the country. Because when Joe Junta left, I mean, Joe is a fantastic oh, great. He's done yeah. a great job in Des Moines. And I remember, I think it was, we talked about this before, I think you had him back not too long ago, 15 maybe, or 14 or 15. He was back a while. And uh, so do you have yeah. contact with him on a regular basis or not? Or Every once in a while, I yeah. do. Yeah, I think he, yeah. he's, he's I, we're starting to get to the point where he might be the one conductor who's been around conducting orchestras in Iowa longer yeah. than I have. So yeah. right. Uh, right. I really look up to him. And Joe's fa fabulous. One of the greatest compliments I receive on a regular basis is, yeah, you just really remind us of Joe and yeah. all the energy he put into the orchestra. Yeah. And to me, that's the biggest compliment to say, you know, yeah. 
it's probably one of the reasons why this orchestra has had such a great history. We've had some directors who have oh, devoted themselves and absolutely. to follow in that lineage for me, that's a really great honor. Okay, we're going to take one more short break here on the Steel Report of talking about the 90th year of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra. Just extraordinary. We'll come right back and wrap things up here in a moment. And welcome back to this week's edition of The Steel Report, talking about the 90th anniversary of the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony Orchestra. And you know, education is a, a big thing for the future of this community as far as the symphony. So how many programs do you have? How many kids are you serving right now? Well, we each year, and most people probably don't know this, we serve over 7,000 students Unbelievable. Um, in, yes. our, in our education I programs. That, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we have lollipop concerts mm -hmm. for uh, small children and their families to come and, and be really close to the musicians. Um, we, uh, Jason goes out into the, into the schools, not just in the metro area here, but out in northeast Iowa, Fantastic. into classrooms. We have musicians go out and do concerts for school assemblies. Um, and, um, and then we have our kind of our culmination of our educational year is at the Gallagher Blue Dorn. We do a full orchestra concert. Kids are bussed in. Over 4,000 kids come in for those, for those concerts. So uh, we're just, and it's, it's been inspirational to me mm -hmm. to hear not only the students that are coming now, but to hear adults now that talk about, wow. oh, I connected with Waterloo Cedar Falls mm -hmm. Symphony when I went to my first lollipop concert. Yeah. And so it's just really, that continuing was really, really inspiring. Well, that's, and that has to be so amazing for these young people. You come in there, Jason, with the passion that you have and the talent. I know clarinet's your specialty, but wow, I mean, they must be blown away by when you get talking to them about music because you're so passionate. Yeah. We, we have a lot of fun with the kids. Yeah. And, and you know, I try to, I try to um, make sure that anything we do with, with youth and that, you know, sometimes I'll accompany a musical group for a school assembly or give one myself. Other times I'm right there in the classroom with the kids and try and tailor that conversation to get them excited about music. Yes. To me, that's, you know, that, that's for everybody. I mean, that, that can be something that applies as much to a third grader as it does mm -hmm. to somebody who's, who's gone to hundreds of symphony concerts in their life. Is we, we want them to be excited about the music and with kids, you know, that's such a wonderful entry point and get them engaged and excited. So we really try to do that with, with all of our education programs, but especially at the elementary school level. Those kids are just learning about uh, general music. They're starting to think about playing an instrument, come to the orchestra. If that's exciting, we think we can help kind of support the teachers work in the schools and get those kids excited about playing an instrument and being involved in music. That's fantastic. Well, let's real quickly recap what's coming up on New Year's Eve on December 31st at the Gallagher Mood Arm Performing Arts Center. What's happening that night? We are having a New Year's Eve party mm -hmm. that, that night. Um, <laughs> that include, I, I mean, how many times do you have a built-in group of 55 or 60 musicians coming to your New Year's Eve party. Mm, that's fantastic. Um, so uh, we're going to do a concert in the Great Hall at Gallagher Blue Dorn, followed by an after party in, in the lobby. Um, and um, so there'll be dancing and food and wine and party favors and a ball drop and just all the fun stuff that, that we do at, at New Year's. And I, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the dancing in well, particular? Well, you know, I, I was going to just amplify what you said, Rich, which is how often do you actually get to dance? Yeah to a live orchestra. Right. I mean, it's one thing just to have a New Year's Eve party and the orchestra shows up. Hey, look, the orchestra showed up. It's great. But at this concert, we're going to invite the audience to waltz Fantastic. to the orchestra. So we'll, we'll play some music um, to kind of open the evening, some fun stuff from, from the Vienna New Year's mm -hmm. uh, tradition. And we'll even throw a few surprises in there. We're doing that all year. Each concert has, right. has a surprise or two. And then the second half of our concert will feature dancing to waltzes, big dance floor right in front of the orchestra. Uh, then there'll be more dancing afterwards as well. Mm -hmm. Once the orchestra right. has put the instruments down, there'll be some jazz music in the lobby. So those folks who like to cut a rug, as they say, <laughs> will have plenty uh, to do at this concert. And of course, dancing live to the orchestra. I've, I've done a couple of these waltz events with, with full orchestra playing, and it's so cool to dance to an orchestra. I can just tell you that right now. It is really neat, singular experience. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Melodies Till Midnight, it's called. Right. So that's going to be a great thing. And again, best way to get tickets for that, Rich? Um, is to, you can go to the Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony website, which is wcfsymphony.org, mm -hmm. or you can call Unitix uh, at 319-273-4849. Uh, and um, I would be remiss if I did not um, talk for a minute about the people that help us make those mm -hmm. things, make this concert possible. Um, uh, it's probably not well known that uh, less than half of our revenue actually comes from ticket sales. Wow, okay. Um, so um, our lead sponsor for New Year's Eve is, is Buzz Anderson. Okay. Um, and then we also have support from uh, Jim and Amy Koloff and Kent and Barb Oppheim. Just great community people who support the arts in, in our 
in the Cedar Valley. Oh, that's fantastic. That's what it takes. You need community support and a tremendous 90th year. I just can't believe it. It's fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations already. Happy birthday, so yeah. to speak. <laughs> Thank you, Rob. Yeah, that's right. Unfortunately, we're out of time for this week's Steel Report. Thanks for watching. We'll be back here next week. We're also online on kwwl.com. Thanks for watching.